Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what is the first in UK and the Changing Europe series of events called Unlocked, which are going to be in-depth conversations with notable people. I'm delighted that we can kickstart with a very notable person. I'll come back to Fiona in a moment. Just a few uh, housekeeping things. Firstly, profound and grateful thanks to Nationwide, and particularly to Paul Riseborough up there, uh, who've agreed to let us have this wonderful room that has only heightened my sense of... Uh, private sector envy, which anyone who works in a university <laughs> suffers from anyway. But, uh, wow. Uh, better not get used to this. Uh, but thank you so much, Paul, and all your team for this. Secondly, for those who don't know UK and are changing Europe, uh, we're a network of academics who are trying to make post-Brexit Britain intelligible to anyone. Uh, if you haven't already, then if there's one thing you can do to thank us for Nationwide's free breakfast, it's to go to our website. Uh, have a look, and if you want to share it, that would be great. But do have a look at our stuff. And if you want to be in touch about doing events with us in the future, that would be great. And the third housekeeping thing is you will see up there a QR code for Slido. Uh, Slido allows you to ask questions, which will appear miraculously on this iPad here. A couple of things about the Slido system we're using today. Firstly, you can vote for the questions you want me to pose to Fiona, and that makes my life a lot easier because the questions stream in <laughs> rather than me sort of flicking through them. If you vote for the ones that you think are most interesting, uh, they will appear on the top of my list. Secondly, there is no guarantee I'm going to turn to Slido at all in the sense that if our conversation seems to be going well and if you all seem wrapped, uh, we might just keep going and not bother turning to audience questions, but we'll just see how that goes and play it by ear. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce, in the very, very slim chance there's someone here who doesn't know her, Fiona Hill, who is Senior Fellow in the Centre on the United States and Europe at Brookings, and in the past has worked as National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia under Presidents Bush and Obama, and Deputy Assistant to the President, they do long titles in the they US, do. don't they? And Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council under Donald Trump. That's like half a CV, isn't it, if you write it? The out. acronyms sound very silly, though, if you shot okay, it. Okay, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be thinking about that as we go. <laughs> so what we're going to do, I mean, Fiona, first and foremost, has written this, which you should all go out and buy. Uh, and this is a book, it's an autobiography, but an analysis and a book about public, it's, it's so many different things at once, I really strongly recommend it to you. But because Fiona's had such a rich and varied career and has such rich and varied expertise, we're going to try and do several things. We're gonna, obviously going to start off talking about what's happening in Ukraine, what might happen, what it means for the West. We're going to talk a little bit about the US, her experience of working in the White House. And hopefully at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about a theme that I know is close to your heart, Fiona, which is inequality, her experiences growing up, whether the world has changed for the better since those days. The whole, if you like, for those of us in the UK familiar with that lingo, levelling up uh, agenda. But to start with where we are now, Fiona, welcome, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> welcome home. Uh, what has most surprised you about what's happened in Ukraine? What's taken you about the most? Well, look, I think um, many people were anticipating that this uh, war would be over very quickly. So um, I think, uh, I, well, we can't say it's a pleasant surprise, though, can we? Um, but let's just say that the staying power of uh, the Ukrainian military, uh, the resilience of uh, the people of Ukraine across the board has been really quite remarkable. And then also, um, you know, frankly, the performance of the Russian military. Mm. I'm sure many people here were having the same kinds of discussions that I was um, in the you know, week or so uh, before the invasion on February 24th, when the US uh, government was already um, warning everybody of the imminence of the invasion. And then there was an awful lot of not just armchair generals, but people who are actually uh, genuinely expert on military issues, who are, of course, predicting that this would be over within 48, 72 hours. And, of course, we then later learned that uh, the Kremlin had prepared a statement for Putin that got leaked out to the press uh, that was supposed to be given somewhere around February 26th or 27th, you know, the infamous uh, mm -hmm. victory speech, uh, then la laying the path for where we were going to go forward. Now, unfortunately, we've got into the horrors of the grind of an open-ended conflict. And that is now taken on dimensions that are not surprising, given, you know, what we've seen in other historical 
situations that are very similar, and also in the case of Russia itself in Chechnya in the 1990s. I mean, I have a lot of people here who I know I've worked with, you know, back in that capacity back in the 90s and seeing uh, the, the conflict in Chechnya, but also all of us who observed what happened in Syria once the Russian uh, military intervened uh, to help prop up uh, Bashar Assad and basically level the country. So it's kind of a modern day equivalent of home by Christmas, isn't it? I mean, yes. it's sort of, you keep making these mistakes. Would you say it's, it's still inevitable that Russia will win? I think it depends if you define win. Um, it's, uh, I mean, look, Bashar al-Assad is still in Syria and has been out, seen, you know, out and about in the Middle East after, you know, what was it, 2012? Bashar, you know, Assad must go. Hmm. Uh, and this is, you know, 10 years on. Yeah. And he's still there. So I think it's entirely possible that we still have Vladimir Putin sitting in the Kremlin years from now, um, surrounded by rubble um, in, in Ukraine and uh, a disaster also at home. I think, you know, right now it's unpredictable. Why is it, do you think, we've reached the point we've reached? Is it because Russian, Russian hardware wasn't as good as we thought, Russian leadership hasn't been good, or just that the Ukrainians have been far, far better than we'd assumed? Earlier? It's a combination of all of these things. Um, look, Putin himself, when he was back in the KGB and in his um, run-up to becoming president um, of, uh, of Russia, was very much engaged in the idea of contingency planning. And, you know, if you look at some of the um, quotes from Putin... Uh, when he's asked about, you know, events, he will always say that nothing goes exactly as you plan, and then you, you know, you basically have to adjust and adapt, uh, adapt your plans. So, um, you know, Putin may have had an idea of how this was going to go initially, but then, of course, there was the reality of the performance of the military, the morale, I mean, the fact that they were using conscripts, mm -hmm. uh, which is, again, this looks a lot like Chechnya after um, uh, the first uh, several weeks of yep. uh, the conflict there. Uh, then there is, of course, the um, heroic and um, amazing resistance that um, the Ukrainian people, as well as the, the military, have mounted. Uh, President Zelensky himself, having risen to the occasion mm. and absolutely exceeded probably even his own estimations of what he was capable of, as some people certainly do in that moment, and not just him. Uh, obviously, Mayor Klitschko of Kiev, the mayors of so mm -hmm. many Ukrainian cities. Um, there's, there's a quote by um, one of uh, somebody who everybody knows here, Lucien Kim, who had uh, former uh, bureau chief of NPR in a piece that he wrote for the Kennan Institute recently. He said, Russians remain the, ru the subjects of their ruler, while Ukrainians are the citizens of their own country. And the Ukrainians are proving that because they have agency, each individual person, groups of networks. Uh, basically, you are seeing... Um, uh, basically a highly networked horizontal society fighting back against a, a vertical of power that's proving to be very brittle. And I think you know, this is in a, in a modern war. I mean, all of us are in real time being able to follow along what's happening and respond to it as well. And it's that kind of large response that I think is... Uh, when you asked me at the beginning what surprised me the most, I actually have to say that it's been the response of, of, of everyone. When people here, uh, ordinary people... Every, every day I'm meeting someone who is, you know, dashing off somewhere to um, uh, take um, in a Ukrainian uh, family, people I've known from the north of England who've just got in a car and driven supplies down to the border with uh, Ukraine and either Romania or Poland, people just responding on, on this level of their own volition. It's not because they're being directed to by a government. It's not because they're being pushed to respond because of sanctions. It's because they're watching this and they feel that they can actually do something as well. Now, that's what makes things also very unpredictable mm. because that means that there's all kinds of things happening that we can't always track. But I think that's been the surprise, has been yeah. the way that people have responded. But admittedly, though, it's in Europe, it's the United States, it's in the kind of Western world. And of course, that's not really the response in, uh, in other places. But it's just that remarkable response, spontaneous response from people has been really quite astounding. OK, and, and talking about that sort of Russian sort of hierarchy, uh, I think the last book you wrote before this one was a sort of psychological profile of, of President Putin. Now, there's a lot been said about him in his splendid isolation, whether because of being sort of stuck essentially by himself over COVID, uh, his thinking is not as rational as it otherwise might have been. I mean, wh how do you assess his state of mind? And do you think there is some truth in these sort of stories? Well, I do think there's an element of that. I mean, we've all been um, in that position and lots of people have you know, suffered a great deal you know, psychologically and um, you know, in, in, in real terms um, during you know, this whole period of the pandemic. 
But it's very much the case, as, you, as you're saying, that it's evident about how isolated Putin is. I mean, it's not just the incredible distance on the tables in which he's meeting Macron. I mean, many of us actually here have actually been at those tables. I've got a picture of myself sitting at it. And it looks actually quite small when you've got a lot of people sitting around it, when you're kind of sitting on either end of it. You know, that, with that splendid isolation and distance, it just underscores part of the problem. And having um, been, there's a few other people in here who've been advisors to you know, various prime ministers and you know, other leaders, you know how difficult it is to bring bad news <laughs> as the messenger. You know, yeah. You're know, you obviously not very welcome. Sometimes you're just ignored completely, been there, done that. Uh, and you, know, you can just imagine trying to get through that bubble in the Kremlin to get information to uh, Putin. And then you know, what's he doing with his spare time? I mean, he's obviously not down in his dacha on the Black Sea that Alexei Navalny told us all about all the time. He's, you know, poring over documents. I had this sort of feeling that he was down in the Kremlin archives sorting out old history books and maps of kind of like thinking about, you know, Russia that was and that Russia could be. Because he certainly seems to have been stewing in his own juices. And it's been really sort of an exaggeration of things that he believed before. I mean, Arkady Ostrovsky's here, and you've talked an awful lot about this and things that you've, um, you know, kind of written and, um, uh, you know, recent uh, articles that, you know, lots of the signs of Putin's you know, animosity towards um, you know, the, the peoples who have got away from uh, the Kremlin, got away from the center, has always been evident. I mean, you think about the brutality of Chechnya, and he, of course, he came into the presidency against the back uh, backdrop of the uh, renewal of the war in 1999, yeah. the Second Chechen War, and then presided over really the annihilation of um, the, the Chechen political class, and of course, imposing. Um, a, a bully and a tyrant uh, in uh, the place of uh, the previous leadership yep. uh, in the form of Ramzan Kadyrov, who you know, he continues to deploy in uh, places uh, like Ukraine. Uh, and the emotional way in which he talked about Chechnya. We remember about how he talked in a press conference about wiping you know, everybody out in the outhouse, you know, lots of uh, violent interactions verbally with journalists who asked him questions. So a lot of this has been in evidence before, but it certainly seems that he's hardened, his attitudes have hardened, his views have hardened, and very unlikely that anyone's being able to remonstrate with him. I, mean, the, I think the prevailing view is that this whole invasion was planned by a couple of people himself and I mean certainly not a, a large kind of group like this and so there was very little input and you know he was obviously pretty much convinced uh, about the the, the rectitude of, of his actions and he remains focused on still fulfilling the original sets of goals as he says. Now at the start of the invasion if I'm not mistaken you said that it's perfectly possible that Putin would use all the weapons at his disposal including Absolutely. potentially nuclear ones. You still think there's a danger of that. I do. And I mean, in some of the statements that, you know, he's been making, you know, recently, he seems to be, you know, so he's kind of putting that possibility out. But in a way, he's already used them, right? So by talking about this verbally, it's intended to intimidate everybody. And so one of the last meetings that I was in with President Trump and uh, President Putin in Osaka mm. at the um, uh, G20 in um, 2019, Putin looked at Trump. And um, it was basically after there was the announcement of pulling out of the INF by the United States, and that was going to be coming up within a month. And he said, you know, your European colleagues remember the Euro missile crisis. I think they're going to be remembering this again, Donald. And President Trump didn't quite pick up on the kind of the menace and the threat that was being made there, because Putin clearly intended to bring us all back to that point of the 1980s and the most recent war scare. Not just the, and remember, he also invoked uh, what the Russians called the Caribbean crisis. I, I had spent a long time knowing <laughs> what that meant. You know, problems in paradise, you know, not enough suntan lotion on the Caribbean, and then realizing it meant the Cuban Missile yeah. Crisis, you know, because it's Caribbean. Uh, and um, then, of course, that also invoking that as well. But that doesn't have as much resonance. I mean, you, I, and actually quite a lot of people here remember the Euro Missile Crisis. That's why I started studying Russian back in 1984 uh, on the, um, uh, as a result of the war scare of November 1983, where I remember Queen Elizabeth II had written a note to all of her fellow Britons, you know, kind of bemoaning the fact we were all then in a fallout shelter or lying in a ditch somewhere. Yep. And basically that's what Putin wanted to bring us right back to that. So this is a deliberate deployment. And of course, during the Soviet period, we had to live with the fact that the Soviet Union had biological and chemical weapons in addition to a whole panoply of battlefield, tactical nuclear weapons, intermediate and strategic weapons that they were quite prepared to use as part of their doctrine. And so Putin is going back to that period. And you know, obviously, if he doesn't have to use it, but he can get the um, 
impact and the effect and the response that he wants mm. to, he will keep on talking about it. Um, we've known ever since um, they made the announcement, or Putin made the announcement of hypersonic missiles and that infamous um, annual address that he showed the video, he was standing, you know, addressing um, all of uh, the, the parliament and uh, they had behind him a video screen and he looked like he was targeting what looked like Florida, um, a peninsula, um, with a, I'm sure lots of people remember that there. And you know, that actually got Trump's um, attention. He said, real countries don't do that. I mean, it was basically, he was pulling a leaf out of Kim Jong-un's book. Yeah. Why? Because that's effective. And so the, the saber rattling with the nuclear weapons is, is effective in a political sense. But it doesn't mean to say that he wouldn't figure out how for demonstration effect to use one in some way. That's really interesting. I must say it was uh, Mitterrand's speech in front of the Bundestag back then that led me to do my PhD. Yeah. So, formative well, moments. probably, I mean, yeah. uh, that would be the, the silver lining that lots of people will start flocking to King's College. I remember <laughs> when, yes. To do PhDs, <laughs> you know. So we've got a question from Andrew Craig who says any sort of peace or any sort of negotiated settlement is going to require security guarantees for Ukraine. I paraphrase you, Andrew, I'm sorry. How the hell can that work, given that we don't trust Russia? That's exactly the big problem, isn't it? And I think that anything that we're thinking about right now can also only be looked at in temporary terms. So I mean, if we look back again um, to, I'll just use Chechnya again as an example, because I have you know, a direct experience of this. I mean, there were a number of us here who were involved in the, the back door negotiations, as well as some of the set piece for the Hasevut Accord in 1997. And this was you know, basically meant to have a longer term perspective and agreement. There would be autonomy for Chechnya. There would be a referendum. And then we were told by some of uh, the Russians who'd been involved, including Alexei Albatov, who um, is, he's actually said this you know, quite publicly now, that this would only be temporary. That as soon as Russia had regained its strength and regrouped, that the war would be back on again. And in fact, within about 18 months, that was exactly the case. So I think you know, part of the problem that we have here is um, you know, there are many people here who have negotiated all of these kinds of agreements, is that there's no, um, even with security guarantees, uh, there is no guarantee that you're not going to be back into conflict again, and so we're going to have to think about what exactly we're going to do. 1994 with the Budapest um, agreement, yeah. it was obviously assurances um, were pretty much uh, meaningless. And uh, with all of the Minsk uh, various uh, accords, uh, we got nowhere, mm. and kind of thinking through exactly the security aspects of this. And if the Russians continue to be insistent on demilitarization uh, as well as neutrality, then there is absolutely no way that um, the, the Ukrainians can have any sense of security. And initially, when uh, Russia was pl putting out the, the kind of minimal ideas, the sort of the baseline for negotiations and talking about um, Ukrainian neutrality, all you had to look as to the way that the Russians treated Ireland, which is the ultimate neutral country, just on the eve of the war, when people here will recall, of course, that the um, Russian uh, Navy sent in um, a, a series of ships for an exercise off the Irish coast in, in the Atlantic inside the um, exclusive economic zone. Mm. And the Irish protested, and of course they sent the trawlermen out. I mean, it was all in the, in the papers here, um, to, because it was interfering with the, the fishing um, uh, sites. But then they got a very hostile note back from the um, Russian foreign ministry to the Irish foreign ministry accusing them of aggression. And this is, you know, Ireland that is a completely neutral country, obviously not the slightest bit aggressive towards uh, Russia. And that also just underscored that neutrality would get you absolutely nothing. So we're going to have to, if we're going to get anywhere beyond something of a, a temporary truce, be really serious in think, figuring about uh, how can we um, guarantee Ukraine. Of course, the only real guarantee of Ukraine's long-term security is its ability to defend itself, as we're seeing as a result of um, the conflict here. And, and that, I mean, I know that isn't part of the question, but that's where the whole issue of nuclear weapons comes in, which is very troubling. Because back in the early 1990s, when the first pressure started to be exerted on Ukraine, it was when Ukraine had inherited the nuclear, strategic nuclear arsenal yeah. from the collapse of the Soviet Union along with Belarus and Kazakhstan. And the whole Budapest uh, agreement was intended to give them assurances for giving up those nuclear weapons. But the message from all of this conflict and the more that Putin keeps putting nuclear weapons out there in a deployable, verbal, as well as potential uh, real uh, sense, is just more pressure on countries like yeah. Ukraine to think about the only real way for defense is to rush out and get a nuclear weapon if you're not going to get um, 
uh, guarantee. So this is the thorniest part of this whole situation. And presumably the more, the more evidence that is uncovered about war crimes, the harder it is for the Ukrainians to sit down at a table anyway. That's right. So actually we might reach a stage where negotiation becomes impossible because yeah. both sides are so dug in. Exactly right. So you're familiar with the what we might call the, the John Mearsheimer thesis and the blowback there's been. What did you make of that? I mean, do you, did, do you think he had a point that the West provoked Russia or should have thought this through a bit more carefully or treated Russia as great powers expect to be treated? Well, look, there is some element of um, the issue about NATO for certain in all of this. And I mean, I've talked publicly about you know, my experiences in 2008 when I was um, at the National Intelligence Council and we advised against... I mean, of course, you've got to put it in a you know, kind of rather more, um, as people know from being intel analysts, you've got to put it in a different sort of way. You know, that implies this wouldn't be a great idea, but you don't exactly, you know, lay out the policy. Uh, that um, putting on a membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia at the um, Bucharest summit in April of 2008 uh, was a mistake because we knew we couldn't um, actually get the membership action plan. Mm. And what we worried about as analysts, having uh, done um, all of the assessments, first of all, that there was so much opposition on the part of major European powers, including the United Kingdom, to be honest, and as well as uh, France and Germany. Of course, there was a lot of support coming from the Baltic states and Poland and you know, some of the other uh, neighbours um, to Ukraine. That... Um, uh, this was not likely uh, to uh, come to fruition. And also, it was the issue of security guarantees because we also ran through what we thought was likely to be the Russian reaction. And we actually did have on our assessment the annexation of Crimea and military action. And, of course, that's the JIC, you know, the Joint in in Intelligence Committee. Mm -hmm. was also on the same um, place. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we moved ahead. Um, President Bush and uh, Vice President Cheney uh, wanted to support Ukraine and Georgia. And we got a compromise that was, you know, as I've said, many others have said, the worst of all worlds. Because there wasn't a membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia. It was just a kind of a vague open door uh, for some time in the future. And there was no thinking through about what we would do if there was a response from Russia, which there was. Within four months, uh, Russia had invaded Georgia. Mm. And we immediately, you know, kind of scrambled around. So part of the issue was, and this sort of gets to um, where Mayor Sharm has laid things out, we should have been thinking all the way through what we were going to do in eventualities. It's like if you take out insurance in a flood zone, mm. you, know, you usually do try to think about how you're going to yeah. shore up your house if this particular floods are, you know, happening with more and more frequency. Uh, people like Putin, as he said after the invasion of Georgia, I threatened, I delivered. Yep. So you knew he was actually going to do something. So what were we going to do about it? But I, I don't believe that that's the full uh, explanation for what happened because Putin has been fixated on uh, Ukraine for a very long time, irrespective of uh, the um, issue about NATO. And there's also been a very strong... Uh, anti-Ukrainian sentiment in terms of U Ukraine as a separate polity since the early 1990s in Russia. Um, if you go back to that period before the Budapest Memorandum, there was assassinations of Crimean Tatars. There was um, a lots of saber-rattling and threats coming out of the Russian Duma. This is the whole period when, uh, uh, under Boris Yeltsin, there was the right to protect was exercised by uh, the Russian parliament for Russians abroad. You know, there's the whole concept of the near abroad. And then, you know, we, we've seen even more so that Putin has got into this sort of post-colonial, post-imperial thought and declaring that Ukrainians and Belarusians are simply Russians uh, as they were categorised under the imperial period. And there's a lot more that goes into this as well. I think there's personal animosity. Uh, there's, you know, kind of Putin's own, uh, I think, personal obsession. Uh, with Ukraine and Crimea that I think, you know, goes somewhere deep into his own personal history that we haven't completely unearthed yet. So it, it's not as neat and tidy as Mearsheim and others would yeah. like to suggest. So it does strike me that we, by which I probably mean the Americans, have sometimes got a problem about cheap talk. I mean, you go all the way back to the Marsh Arabs and Bush senior. Yes. And, you know... And the Kurds. And yeah, and the, the Kurds. Yeah, exactly. And making, making sort of rhetorical promises that you right. can't or have no intent, or even uh, Barack Obama's red line. Comment, yep. that we need to be careful that we can deliver on what we say. Now, I don't want to spend a load of time talking about UK foreign policy here, but just viewed from the outside, if you can view these things from the outside, what have you made of the UK's reaction to events in Ukraine? Well, I have to say that early on, um, I think, you know, the Defence um, Secretary's uh, comments about, you know, Putin's mythologising about um, uh, Ukraine were very powerful. 
Uh, and I think that had a big impact back in the United States because he just called them out. And, and you know, basically for the myth making and the distortion of history. And the article he wrote. It was the article, yeah, yeah exactly. And you know, also pointing out that you know, um, just because you speak Russian doesn't make you Russian. Exactly, as if we all speak English, then but we have not everybody's English, are they? I mean, it's not that dissimilar from if the UK decided to invade Ireland uh, to kind of resolve the Irish question again, or that the United States decided to invade Canada because we're getting uh, English speakers getting repressed by uh, all those French speakers and uh, Quebec or something. I mean, this. Is, you know, he, he called it out and just pointed out the fallacy of the arguments. I think that was very effective. Also, I think um, Britain moving quite quickly on uh, the arms provision also did come back into the United States, sort of stiffening a bit of uh, the resolve there. I can't say that I feel quite the same about all the visa issues uh, for the um, uh, Ukrainian refugees. I did look online myself and found that incredibly complicated. And I have a friend who's been filling it out for family and it took them 27 hours just to get all the way through the forms and then it died on them and they had to start all over again. So um, it, it, that could be, uh, I think, certainly addressed. But it all gets into the point that you've just been talking about, about this, the way this conflict is unfolding. We're in for a long, hard grind here. Yep. And I think uh, all of the countries have to coordinate. We have to pull together. We have to figure out, I think the Prime Minister's off to India, mm -hmm. figuring out how to talk to you know, counterparts in other parts of the world to explain what this is and what it isn't. Uh, that this is not a proxy war. This is not just all about NATO. This is more a post-colonial, post-imperial grab. This is you know, kind of the... Uh, Ukraine should not be suffering for all the kind of various imperial sins of Britain or you know, the United States yeah. in the past here. And I think that we're going to have a, a pretty hard job in keeping this all together in a unified fashion. And I think you know, Britain working with European counterparts is pretty essential as well, making sure that we all continue to be on the same page. Because there's, all, there's many different ways in which this can go pear-shaped. Yeah. I think even within the West, it's, you know, the reaction so far has been pretty united, but as the costs mount up, and you're talking about rebuilding as That's well, right. then actually... That well, and the impact here on petrol prices, yep. I mean, the United States, those are all rising, inflation, uh, food security, food prices, um, it's mm. going to be very difficult. And, I mean, of course, we've got the French election coming up and um, you know, a lot of trepidation about where that might be, might be headed. And what do you think would happen if Le Pen won? What would that mean? Well, she's already said that she wants to push back against all of this and doesn't believe that... And given the fact that we know she's taken money from the Russians, uh, for, I mean, how, how are people going to handle that? I think it's going to be very difficult. But leaving that to one side, the, the sort of potential of her winning NATO presumably comes out of this reinforced, doesn't it? All things being equal. I mean, we'll get on to a second Trump presidency later on, but... It, again, it depends on what we mean by reinforce, because, I mean, in a way, we're getting dragged back to the past. Yeah. And, um, you know, I recall, I mean, other people here were also part of this exercise, you know, 2010, the whole idea of trying to come up with a new concept that would be, you know, for the, for the 21st century. And we seem to have now gone back to a concept for the 20th century. And, and that's, you know, deliberate on the part of Putin, because, again, this is a war of choice on his part, and there's a small group of people that he decided this with. And, and he wants, in a way, NATO to be reinforced with the old-style concept and the old-style sense of threats, because he, it feeds into his narrative that this is all about NATO. Mm. And, you know, obviously it feeds into John Mearsheimer's <laughs> presentations as well. When, when really, you know, we were in the process of trying to figure out how to make NATO fit for purpose for a, for a new framework. And that new framework is still there. Yeah. So if we're thinking about reinforcing our ties, reinforcing our values, reinforcing our relationships, that's one thing. But reinforcing NATO as an old-style alliance, I think we have to still think about that. Now, obviously, with Sweden and Finland contemplating you know, their relationship uh, with uh, NATO, again, that sort of seems to reinforce the old-style. But, you know, NATO... Uh, has proven the ability to evolve over mm -hmm. time. There are, there are groupings uh, within NATO that I think can take uh, the uh, organisation in different directions. But I think we have to keep in mind that there are still other challenges and we, we shouldn't be falling back into the patterns that Vladimir Putin wants us to fall back into. That being said, though, there is sometimes a danger, isn't there, that we, we, we're desperate to move on and forget the lessons. I mean, you know, Absolutely. you think about that 
pr that famous debate between Obama and Romney when Obama said, you know, the 80s are on the phone asking for their foreign policy back. I mean, that doesn't <laughs> seem quite as smart a comment now as it, as it maybe did then. But it's, do you think one of the problems is we were too quick to say, OK, that's Russia done, let's move on? Well, yes, absolutely we were. And, you know, just because the 80s is, is back in vogue, along with 80s music. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, never uh, out of vogue. You know, never, 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 never gone, yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, there's, there's certainly that sort of pervasive um, you know, sort of sense of uh, the past. Um, we, really, we really should not have uh, taken our eyes off, uh, off the ball with Russia, absolutely not. And I think that has been uh, a major problem. I, I mean, in many respects, just the fact of the longevity of Putin has lulled us all into a kind of a sort of sense of yeah. false security. I mean, people keep saying, well, what kind of man is he? He's been there for 22 years. I mean, there are many people here who have met with him over and over again. He's actually quite predictable particularly in this brutality, and people say, it's changed. Well, actually, there's been this thread there all along, if you were watching and you mm. know, listening to him. He hasn't changed that much. He's kind of ossified and hardened somewhat. But you know, he hasn't really changed that much. And he is a creature of the 1980s. He's all about grievance and loss and his own you know, prime. You know, President Trump, when I was working with him, uh, in the book, he's 80s man. I, I couldn't believe it. It was just a total throwback. Uh, to the 1980s. Everything was framed in that context. And, you know, in some respects, you know, analysing the 80s is quite helpful for how we got to here, but we have to be able to move on. So we have to factor that in and, and figure out then, you know, on my comment again about NATO was absolutely, you know, reinforcement of the values and the underpinnings and the connections, the networks, the ways of working together, but still trying to think about a, a complex future. Yeah. And, and this... Um, in many respects, look, this is also a throwback to World War I. Uh, I I've you know, mentioned before that you know, lots of people are tearing their hair out about, oh my God, we're, in, you know, we're heading towards World War III. We're already in it. If you're thinking about World War II being a continuation of uh, the settlements or the lack of settlements in World War I, Putin is still basically fighting back against the idea that Ukraine had any right for independence. And of course, there was brief periods of independence for Ukraine after World War I, the creation of modern Ukraine in the Soviet period uh, with the um, whole formulation of Ukrainian nationality took place in that post-World War I environment. And Syria, uh, when the Russians intervened, uh, you know, I talked to some people from the Kremlin about this. They thought, saw this as their opportunity to move into the remnants of the Ottoman Empire that they'd been denied um, the chance to do because of the collapse of the Russian Empire in uh, basically the end of World War I. So from Putin and the Russians' point of view, they're still playing out the, the loss, not just of the Soviet Union, but of the Russian Empire and trying to drag everybody else back into that phase as well. So we have to bear that also in mind as we try to analyse and figure out where we're heading next. Do you think it's fair to say they're obsessed with history and we don't think about history enough? Yes, exactly. Well, sometimes here in Britain... We no, we think about history here in Britain, yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, the United States <laughs> is always, every day, is a, uh, you know, it's kind of like a blank slate and you can start again, but, you know, nonetheless, you know, history does cast a shadow. Yeah. So, I mean... I'm sorry about this question. I mean, I had to ask it. I don't know whether there is an answer, but how, how would things have played out differently if Donald Trump had been in the White House? He would have said, just take it. I mean, look what he did. What did he do? He said, do us a favour. Was that... But basically, that was over, over withholding military um, assistance and, you know, in, in terms of withholding a meeting in the Oval Office for President Zelensky. He saw Ukraine as his plaything. So the likelihood that he would have kind of stepped up to block Putin from doing something is pretty slim. So you genuinely think... He was think withholding military assistance from Ukraine. Yeah. He believed that because everybody spoke Russian, they were therefore Russian. We did try to point out that Canadians are Canadians and, you know, English people are English and, you know, therefore... But anyway, uh, that was also by the by. He told Putin openly on a couple of occasions, publicly said that he thought the Crimea belonged to Russia. And he was already uh, undermining NATO on every uh, particular front as well and blowing up relationships with, um, I'm seeing a few people who we've had some painful encounters uh, in that uh, period for the European Union and you know, NATO and other relationships. So I don't believe that he would have stepped forward in any way to push back. Remember he told Angela Merkel in uh, the first encounter on Ukraine when she said, um, what about Ukraine? He said, well, what about Ukraine? That's not my issue. That's yours. He repeatedly pushed back against getting involved in Ukraine and, and believed that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 election. He firmly believed that. Okay. 
there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful phrase in your book where you say that Trump came to resemble Putin in political practice and predilection more than recent American predecessors. What, can you just talk us yes, through what you mean Yes, more than he resembled. More than he resembled, yeah. His previous American predecessors. Well, look, um, I mean, I guess plenty of people have seen me talking about this um, publicly, including during the first impeachment uh, trial, but um, he was somebody who wanted to stay in power himself and saw the presidency as highly personalised, um, which is a feature of the Russian presidency. As Putin sees the presidency in, in Russia and the people around him see it, remember Putin's um, own advisors have said there is no Russia without Putin, mm -hmm. that it's a, basically a form of the autocracy, a form of the monarchy. And in, in many respects, um, going back to the 1990s and the writing of uh, the uh, Russian constitution that enshrines that uh, presidency as being you know, basically above everything else, um, the, the writers of that constitution included Anatoly Sobchak, uh, Putin's um, law professor and uh, from Leningrad State University, and also uh, his old boss from when he was uh, deputy mayor of, uh, of St. Petersburg. And Sobchak himself was an expert on the efforts to create a constitution under the, um, the czars. Mm. And in a way, kind of felt that the opportunity to rewrite the constitution in the 1990s was to create a kind of unelected monarchy but not with the kind of uh, checks and balances as yeah. we would have in the British um, uh, monarchy. Although they talked about emulating the, the Queen of England, I don't think they quite then read the fine print <laughs> about the way that the uh, constitutional monarchy is set up here. But it was this, this whole idea of the, the president being supreme, not a member of a political party, no checks and balances from the Russian parliament. And, and basically, that's how Trump came to view the American presidency. He saw it as highly personalised. He said it repeatedly, um, publicly, that he believed that he had um, uh, unparalleled rights as the president. Remember, he made the comment during uh, the primary uh, or the campaign about being able to shoot somebody yeah. you know, in New York and there'd be no recourse. Yeah. And he also uh, basically denied that the Republican Party existed. He talked about it as the party of Trump, threatens to you know, basically primary uh, Republican uh, Party members uh, in Congress, saying there's no Congressional Republican Party unless it's beholden to him. Uh, if they uh, try to show any independence, uh, they're basically getting excluded. So he's, he's, and he denied, of course, the right of Congress to have any oversight over the presidency. Two impeachment trials, you know, with uh, little recourse, no censoring of him. We'll see what happens with the January 6th uh, committee. Mm. But, you know, time and time again, uh, Trump has pushed back uh, against uh, checks and balances. Uh, reserving the rights of the presidency not to the executive branch but to the president himself and basically talking about staying in power you know, endlessly which yeah. of course we saw in January 6 and, and Putin of course had amendments go through the Russian uh, parliament in 2020 to extend his, his time in office. I mean there was more of a, the kind of parallels that I brought out in the book yeah. but that's a, a very obvious one straight away and, and you know I was in many meetings where Trump would basically joke to people Oh, yeah, I would like that, you know, being able to stay in power indefinitely. Why did we, you know, kind of introduce term limits? Well, of course, it was because uh, Roosevelt died in office after several terms and, you know, the system was thrown into a tailspin as a result of that. And was it, was it specifically the US you had in mind when you said that no country is immune to the degradation of democracy? Because you hear a lot of that rhetoric. Oh, I, have, I have other countries in mind as well, but I was very specifically <laughs> at that point thinking about the United States because I was living through it. <laughs> Would you think any of that applies here? Or do you I do. I, I worry about, you know, the UK. I, I worry somewhat less, in a way, because the checks and the balances yeah. are still here. I mean, you, you know, the party system is more robust. I mean, there's still the ability to remove one's party leader, whereas in the United States, that's not the case. Um, you know, basically, Donald Trump can't be removed. He's not really the party leader, but there's no way of dislodging him. And the Republican Party is having a really hard time. I know for a fact there are many members of the Republican Party who would like nothing else but to kind of move on and, and do something different, and they cannot. And you know, the party system in the United States um, has really degenerated. I mean, on the Democratic side as well, there's so much factionalism. Where here there is still uh, some discipline, you know, 
uh, within it. And there are still some checks and balances within the system, but it's very easy to erode all of those. So I do worry when I, you know, I read a lot about the, you know, the limitations on protest and on assembly and some of the policing uh, regulations that, uh, and also, you know, frankly, you know, a lot of the centralization still of authority. Uh, that you know, there needs to be a lot more sort of devolution, you know, away from uh, Westminster back into you know the, the rest of the country. That is actually one thing in the United States, uh, the federalism of the system. The kind of still there is a bit of a check and a balance with the yeah. states, but of course you're seeing the nationalisation of local politics in the United States in an extraordinarily healthy way, to, unhealthy way too. This polarisation between red and uh, blue states, yeah. Yeah. which is, I mean, I, for me, I never expected that in all the time that I've been living there. I mean, one of the issues we have here is clearly the way the parties choose their leaders and the role of the membership in that, which is sort of causing some interesting... Yeah, but if you choose them in a kind of a national referendum, which is essentially what happens in the United States, has yep. problems too. There's got yep. to be some kind of happy medium somewhere uh, along there. I'm just going to sort of do a, a bit of a U-turn because there's a really good question here, it strikes me, from Anonymous. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's just... Basically, was there a point during the Putin regime when we could have prevented things getting to them? I mean, is there a moment, you know, you can go back to Georgia, you can go back to Crimea. Was there a moment when we made a mistake that sort of facilitated what happened subsequently? Or I do think we made a lot of mistakes with Georgia because there was too much of a, an assessment that this was all because of Mikhail Saakashvili and everyone was irritated with him in, in, yeah. in any case. And there was a kind of feeling this was personal, even though it was apparent that it was not and that this was you know, kind of much uh, broader. I also honestly think that if the United Kingdom had reacted more strongly to Litvinenko, uh, to um, being poisoned with polonium, and hadn't just continued to do business as usual. And I have a personal peeve over um, the response to Skripal in 2018, uh, oh, when the French and the Germans uh, really did not want to step up on expelling um, intelligence operatives. And you know, basically, um, you know, after the, what happened uh, here in Salisbury, 4,000 people could have died. There was enough Novichok in the vial mm. uh, of, uh, that was put into the perfume bottle to kill not just Don Sturgis and her partner and others um, who were sickened by this, but to wipe out Salisbury. Mm. Uh, and the way that it was brazenly uh, discarded into the, the, the bin, the donation bin for a charity shop. I mean, these, these were all shocking uh, episodes, and we should have had a really strong uh, response so we kind of, in a way, gets back, as opposed to sort of Mearsheimers, but not in the way that he's laying yeah. out. We did not respond in a tough fashion. We kept, kept on business as usual. I mean, I mean, people like Catherine Belton to be kind of dragged through court here, uh, for example. Uh, and, and, and this happened in the United um, States as well. All the people who jumped onto boards or working with oligarchs. I mean, I sounded like, you know, some prissy, uh, you know, where every time at, at Brookings, I said, no, we cannot take money, you know, from this person. And while I was away uh, in the National Intelligence Council, Brookings took some money from, you know, kind of a, an oligarch. And I was furious. <laughs> I couldn't believe that, you know, we'd done all of this. Because this is exactly how... The Russians don't or never thought we were serious. Putin bragged on the eve of uh, the um, intervention of the invasion to a number of uh, European visitors that he could bribe and own anybody. And they, they've got a shock from how we've responded because he basically thought they had everybody in their pocket. So it's a kind of a combination of all of these uh, mistakes. Definitely if they kind of push forward, you know, the old Lenin axiom, and, you know, they, they just basically get mush, they just keep on going. And that is now, you know, the tragedy for Ukraine. Yeah. Because Ukraine is having to, you know, basically meet this with steel. Ukraine is having to be, you know, the point in which, you know, there's kind of, there's no give. I mean, obviously, if anyone wants to donate cash or premises to UK in a changing Europe, you can just ring me. That's very easy. Uh, Trump got some things right, though, didn't he, in foreign policy? He did. I mean, it was, it was interesting listening to him talking about burden sharing. I mean, he yeah. used language that other presidents wouldn't use, but basically he had a point, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He was right. I mean, if people weren't taking the threat seriously, um, you know, then why, why did NATO exist? I mean, that in itself was a point. Um, if, um, you know, countries really believed uh, genuinely there was a threat there, then why were they not, you know, kind of stepping up? I mean, he was, you know, depicting it. It was really, unfortunately, on, on many of these issues where he had the right idea, it was the way that he framed it. Yeah. Because he talked again in the context of NATO as if it was, a, you know, basically a protection agency, a 
a kind of a for hire um, security firm, and a bit bit like um, you know basically. Blackwater or the Wagner Group, in you know some uh, in some ways, because he also talked about people paying for uh, the U.S. military, but like you know the Roman Empire back in the day when they sacked Carthage, because you know nobody was paying you know the for the upkeep of uh, the Roman legions, mm. and so it was just the whole way that he articulated things turned everyone off, mm. and there were many issues that you know he he laid out, um, you know for not dealing with North Korea for example, he, I think he does deserve. Uh, a lot of credit for heading off what was going to be a rather disastrous, we, we, we feared. Uh, we, we really did think that uh, Kim Jong-un was going to lob a missile in the direction of somewhere significant. And, you know, you can have a lot of criticism for the way that Trump interacted with Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong but he seemed to have got the measure of the guy mm. and did head off quite a lot of potential disaster. And we did give him, you know, full credit for that on it because it just seemed so preposterous the way that he was doing it. Now, of course, he didn't achieve a full uh, nuclear agreement with North Korea. And, of mm. course, he rolled back the JCPOA to rather disastrous yep. effect uh, with Iran. Uh, but also with INF, um, he wasn't wrong in wanting to pull out and the people around him either because the Russians continued to violate it. But the problem was that there wasn't the disciplined follow-up about what was going to come next. And in each case where he had the right idea, it was the execution, everything kind of went wrong because he just didn't have the patience for, even with a plan that he'd come up with, he just <laughs> short-circuited it, you know, on the, on the first term. I mean, sometimes yeah. it was comical, and other times it was completely tragic. I feel the greatest tragedy was on arms control issues because he himself, again, being a creature of the 1980s, really wanted to finish off where Reagan and Gorbachev had left off. And he was genuine about this. It's just that he, he wouldn't delegate to other people. And, and again, he, he wouldn't give the process and the system time to operate. Now, I wonder, though, whether his style resonated with his base precisely because people got fed up of the same old overly diplomatic, overly... I mean, it's a sort of international equivalent of what we're going to talk about when it comes to levelling up, is that there was a sort of, for some people at least, a sort of refreshing clarity about what he yeah. said, and it wasn't... And, and that actually speaks to failings in how we used to do things before, possibly, does it? That's exactly right. Look, he was a big middle finger to the yeah. establishment elite. You know, even though he was hardly you know, one of the masses himself. But he was also selling a lifestyle. Um, I remember uh, watching on television when I was younger, The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Was that Clive Crook? And he would kind of take you around people's fancy homes in a way that this was... an what, unexpected turn in the what, conversation. Uh, but this is what I thought about sometimes when Trump was talking to people about, you two can have a gold-plated toilet or, you know, you two can, you know, own half of Manhattan or look at my seven residences and all of my you know, succession of beautiful blonde wives. It was kind of basically selling to people a kind of lifestyle they could aspire to, mostly if you won the lottery, uh, but, you know, kind of... He was basically saying, I'm the pull myself up by my bootstraps guy. I'm my own boss, I'm my own person. You too could be this. And I also hate the establishment. Yeah. And people did believe, um, you know, among my own extended family in the United States, that he was a successful business person. And, you know, for the first time around, they actually genuinely thought that he would, you know, turn things around and, you know, teach people a lesson who'd otherwise been ignoring them. Yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting. That sort of at least they're doing something line is a line you see a lot about the, uh, the UK plan for refugees in Rwanda, which is which put me in mind of that. Uh, I'm not going to draw the parallel any further, but that sort of sense that at least these people are doing something. Uh, is, is quite striking. Now, Robert Cooper's written in to ask how you assess the risk of Trump returning to the White House. Could he win, and what should we do if he does? Well, um, I have my plan to live in a very remote place in Iceland or Finland or somewhere <laughs> um, like Greenland. Um, is it Auckland? In 2024. Yes, uh, no, it might not be far enough away in uh, 2024. <laughs> but uh, joking aside, I think it's um, um, very possible that he will be back in 2024. Um, I can't see how he would uh, not run um, mm. right now, barring um, some unexpected outcome uh, from the um, January 6th uh, committee and investigations there. Uh, I mean, because he could very... I, I just can't imagine he would want to endorse someone else running, as he would see it, and in his frame and in his stead. 
And that kind of becomes the complicating factor. And then there's all kinds of ways that one could play out how we could easily win. A lot of people sitting out the election uh, and not wanting to vote. And there's been a lot of voter suppression anyway and a lot of change in the rules and regulations. There is, um, uh, you know, already, I mean, there's all kinds of evidence that uh, President Biden is having a, you know, real difficulty in getting traction because of domestic issues, uh, you know, rising inflation, rising prices at the, at the pump for um, you know, gasoline, petrol, uh, for example, uh, the aftermath of Afghanistan. As this war grinds on and food prices uh, increase, and uh, mm. there's uh, you know more and more um, risk of uh, further widening of, of the conflict, we have the midterms in 2022 this year coming coming up. We'll have to see how all of that goes. Um, there are just so many ways in which the, that could play out, mm. and I think that that then you know really. Um, requires a, a good deal of hard thinking here in places like the United Kingdom and the European Union and, you know, obviously in Ukraine and elsewhere about how um, one will continue to manage this war as we move forward because I don't think then you know, with uh, Trump in power there will be particularly active engagement on the part of the United States unless Congress and, uh, you know, there's a kind of a, an, an upswelling continuity of public support. Do you think NATO would survive a second Trump presidency? I don't think so, unless, again, Congress uh, steps in because there is very widespread support uh, for Congress. So, I mean, it, it depends on whether one can really exert checks and balances in the system. I mean, there's so much uncertainty. I mean, I kind of hesitate in many respects to mm. speak about this because also then the impact domestically in the United States of Trump winning, mm. because it depends on how he wins. Is it, again, through a narrow margin in uh, the Electoral College? And, I mean, how many times can that happen by losing the popular vote yeah. by a very large margin? I mean, the, you know, we, we worry about the backlash from the Republican base, but about the backlash from everybody else who hasn't voted successively, millions of people whose you know, votes are, are being negated because of the archaic nature of the political mm -hmm. system. And also the fact that he has never stepped back from his big lie of... Uh, He's never acknowledged that um, Joe Biden won uh, the 2020 election. So the whole premise of his presidency will be based on a lie. That will be the death knell of American democracy of, of, uh, and the, of the electoral system. The idea that the, you know, the American system was the gold standard for elections worldwide, there'll be an awful lot of not just head scratching, but a lot of questions about this. And again, a, a bit of a shock to the system that after all of this, after everything that's happened, two impeachments, you know, January 6th, continuing efforts to make it very difficult for people to vote, the continuation of the big lie that a majority, if he wins with a majority of Americans, would still vote for uh, President Trump. Well, I think, you know, be a kind of a chilling effect, uh, certainly here and, and, and around the world, and would open an awful lot of questions about the unity of the West, the values, um, you know, the leadership uh, role. Mm. And in Europe, at least, the fact of having had a Trump presidency means we view the United States differently anyway. That's Absolutely. Sort of sense of and I think, you know, a lot of the things that we're seeing now are a reaction to yeah. this as well. I mean, I certainly, you know, from my own perspective of, you know, living in the United States since 1989, it's been, it's been a real shock. Uh, and, you know, but then people say, well, why on earth did you, um, you know, did you enter uh, government service under the Trump administration? There's a very straightforward answer, public service, and also because of what the Russians um, had done in terms of the intervention. And I did believe that national security would take precedence and discover that it, would, it didn't. And, you know, obviously then I and others, you know, had to, uh, had to speak out about this, uh, you know, kind of putting ourselves forward for some like um, Ambassador Ivanovich and you know, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman at great personal uh, cost and um, at great risk. And, you know, the other people who um, spoke out and, you know, made all of this um, information uh, public. But, um, you know, I always think that public service is a really important thing to do, and particularly when it comes to national security. Domestic politics ought to end where national security begins, and that hasn't been the case. The politicisation of foreign policy, yeah. to me, has become extraordinarily uh, depressing as well as shocking. Hmm. And that would continue, uh, obviously, under another Trump presidency, because it's all about him. It's not about the United States. It's not about America first. It's about him personally. But this idea that politics stops at the water's edge is being eroded. It is being eroded place, everywhere, exactly. Yeah. Uh, incidentally... 
I know you're all going to buy it, but uh, in Fiona's book, the, the, the sections where she talks about her experience in the White House are both equally fascinating and horrifying, actually, I found them. But are, are you glad that you did say yes to that job? I am. I have no regrets about it. And I mean, it, I, a lot of the insights I have now I would never have had. I mean, I don't say one should do that for you know, sort of a social anthropological exercise. You know, that's not the reason. But I mean, it was a, a massive revelation on every front. I mean, I realised how naive I was about politics when I, when I joined that. I, I knew more about Kremlinology and you know, what was going on in other countries in their politics than I did about the United States. It was a kind of a I mean, I, you now see, as a result of those kind of experiences, lots of people here are kind of nodding, surging, saying, yeah, yeah, we all knew all of that from you know, our own experiences of some of the people sitting here have had that as well. You realise the limitations and the constraints and how difficult it is actually to make a positive difference. And I, I think it, I mean, in terms of you know, the reason for writing that book, I wanted to lay that out so other people mm. could see that as well. And the real dangers of populist politics, how we got to this moment, is that being able to, from my own perspective, trace this all the way through from those wrenching changes of the 1980s and seeing the same things happening in the United Kingdom, in Russia and in the United States, that was itself a major revelation. Of course, I could have said the same about Germany and France, but then that would have been a tome, as it was my editor made me chop out chapters that you know, kind of took us off on all kinds of uh, different tangents. But you know, I have no regrets whatsoever. I would do it again. I wouldn't do it in 2024 um, if um, President Trump's come back in, but I would, I would still do what I did in 20, uh, 2017. You do fantastic segues because this, you've moved us straight on to what we wanted to talk about next. I mean, just in terms of, I mean, I was very struck in the book by that comparison that you sort of all the way through, you compare not just the US and the UK, but also Russia in terms of dealing with deindustrialization uh, and the sort of economic hardship that causes to places that have to struggle with it. I mean, I, my first sort of cynical question, I suppose, is don't you, you sort of miss the context with Russia a bit, don't you? I mean, I just, there were points in the book where I sort of wondered whether you overdid it because, yes, there's the same forces, but the system in Russia is so fundamentally different uh, in terms of rule of law, in terms of social safety nets. Are they really that comparable? Well, we've unfortunately converged in a rather negative direction over time. Um, so I wouldn't have made this comparison sometime in the past. Mm. But it's just at the, the moment that we reached in the last several years that I think some of those comparisons become more stark. But I mean, absolutely. I mean, look, the point of the book was not to do... Um, actually, initially, I'd wanted to do a much more of a proper comparison. But COVID intervened. So this is how you know, the book is now in a different format because I couldn't go off and do some of the things that I wanted to do. It would have been perhaps a more boring book, actually, with a more of a, you know, kind of a proper analytical comparison of things. And um, I mean, I liked it because there were so many things going on at once, which was... Yeah, but I, but I did want to bring out some of those stark comparisons more than the obvious contrast, which you've already pointed out, because I think they would have been more obvious to people. But then just the points in which the presidency in the United States started to um, start to resemble the Russian presidency was, was kind of shocking in a way that shouldn't be happening, given what you said, these uh, structural differences. But look, there are, there are a couple of points that I want to make here, growing up you know, where I did in the northeast of England. I grew up in a place that everything was a nationalised industry. So when I went to the Soviet Union, I was just like going to the northeast of England. County Durham was twinned with the Donbass you know, back in the 20s. And a lot of the miners' delegations, there's a, there's a whole you know, um, basically documentation of miners and their wives going off to the Donbass in the 1920s uh, as visits. And, you know, this time when, of course, central planning and you know, the communist system is getting set up. Now, in the 1920s, the mines were not nationalised, but they were obviously later in the 1940s. I didn't know anybody who worked in the private sector apart from the local shopkeeper for the grocery store or the occasional plumber and electrician. And there were whole villages in County Durham where everybody worked in the coal mine or they worked in the steelworks. Remember, British steel, British rail, British coal. And so when everything was uh, Great British rail now. That's right. Just so you know. I'll picture that. 1825 is coming up, or the, uh, the great um, centenary of uh, the passenger railways. But the, um, in the 1980s, uh, with uh, privatisation, mm. it was a huge wrenching shock. And when I got to... Um, the Soviet Union or the post-Soviet Union in the 1990s and saw shock therapy, it was just the same. Now, you wouldn't experience that if you weren't the kid of a coal miner. Mm. I mean, if you were, you know, sort of coming from a different vantage point, you wouldn't see it. I mean, when I went to the Soviet Union in 1987, 
And for the first time in my life, people are like, oh my God, you're the daughter of a coal miner. That's fantastic. You're the, you're the, you know, the kind of the, 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 the basically the, the working class heroes. Mm. And the Durham coal miners were renowned in the, in the Soviet Union, even though at that point, this is just post miners strike and all the coal mines are starting to close down. It was a storied, historic, yeah. um, basically coal mining area. And everybody knew about it and everybody had heard about it. Whereas in Britain, um, the whole place was getting written off. And so that wrenching change of people losing their identities, losing the whole point of existence. I mean, most of the places in County Durham now, I mean, look, the, whole, the most famous museum in County Durham is Beamish, which is a whole yep. history of the kind of an industrial life from you know, the 1820s onwards, where people can kind of go back and kind of feel a sort of a point of pride and think that, that was kind of something we're part of, because you don't feel like you're part of the rest of the United Kingdom. And that's where those comparisons come in, because the people who support Putin are the people from those equivalent places. And why the Donbass? Why was the Donbass so vulnerable? Because the Donbass was the Rust Belt. The Donbass was the place that got left behind. And, and the place where it was kind of a mishmash of people moving in, just like people did to the northeast from England, other parts of England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, and elsewhere to mm -hmm. work in the coal mines. That's what happened in the Donbass. And when the rest of Ukraine or other places moved on, people felt lost there. Same in Michigan and Pennsylvania and all the, um, uh, the coal mining areas of Appalachia. The 70,000 people who tipped the election in 2016 for Donald Trump came from three counties in three states, all of which were the Rust Belt. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a different feeling from being the kid of a coal miner than it is from being somebody else in a different setting. And those comparisons then become very real, even if for somebody else they might be uh, overstretched and overwrought. And again, the base of support for Putin and Trump are very similar. Now, the title of your book, actually I should say, Fiona and I have this weird link. It turns out yeah. that in the mid-1960s, my dad and her mum worked together in Stockton on Tees, which is slightly bizarre. But the, the title of your book, There Is Nothing For You Here, is what your dad said to you about Bishop Auckland. I mean, I suppose the first question is, is that still true today, do you think? Yes, I've just been there for 10 days. And I mean, the, you know, the fact is that the population of the town has grown. Um, I mean, there's more housing, but it's become a kind of a dormitory town. People don't work there, they go somewhere else. And that was basically what my, my father was saying, to get work, you have to go somewhere else. And if you didn't have a car, that was a bit difficult. Now, there's a lot of people still don't have cars in Bishop Auckland. So the council estate, uh, Woodhouse Close, um, where about 2,000 people live, is in the top 2% of the most deprived areas in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And 600 people at least are completely dependent on food banks. And many of the people who I went to school with who have not had a job in all that time. Mm. Now, there are, of course, a lot of people who've done quite well. And, you know, I have friends, you know, from school who've, you know, moved to somewhere else and we've moved back. But they're, you know, basically working in somewhere like Newcastle or they're commuting to Leeds, which, you know, you can't do if you drive fast enough over the Pennines. <laughs> and, you know, they're kind of basically, you know, they're doing well for themselves. But it's not like they're really working in Bishop Auckland. Right. So um, public transportation is still a big issue for a lot of people. But if you've got a car, you can afford a car. And, you know, you've basically got, I think with um, Her Majesty's government moving various the passport office to Durham, Treasury to Darlington, um, there was already the social services moving to Newcastle. There has been a kind of a revitalisation. Mm. There's still these just really entrenchable pockets of deprivation, just like there is here in London as well, in different boroughs. I mean, I was very struck, um, Edwina Morton, somewhere around when I was working on the book, I had a, um, a, an exchange with Edwina, I've lost her somewhere in the audience, oh, there you are, Edwina, right at the very top, who pointed out to me that there was an awful lot of people in London, uh, children growing up in similar circumstances and boroughs, had never actually been into the city of London, and, uh, you know, who um, are basically stuck in their borough, just like, you know, in the, in the northeast of England, people just can't make that that step and can't imagine themselves, you know, going to, um, going to work in these other environments as well. And it's, it's basically because people can't see people like themselves in other positions. Look, Foreign Office, um, you, you probably maybe if people have changed their accents, maybe there are a handful of people from the North East. But I have a, you know, a couple of good friends who've made it into the Foreign Office and so they know almost nobody from the North of England, certainly from working class uh, backgrounds. You know, when I started off, and uh, when I was writing the book, and, I, and there was a bit about uh, me um, in various papers here after the impeachment, when I made a comment about my accent, somebody wrote to me and said, what are you complaining about? There's all these people in entertainment from the Northeast. Look at Anton Deck. And I thought, well, I'm not a comedian. 
I mean, yeah, Anton Deck are fantastic. I love Anton Deck, but I mean, where are the, you know, the not Anton Decks? Where, and people then said there was Harold Wilson. He was a prime minister. I said, yeah, he went to a grammar school and he was a man. You know, where is the northern, you know, kind of um, prime minister who's a woman? There have Cathy Ashton here who's come from a, you know, similar background. But, you know, this is, we're the exceptions that uh, prove the rule here. And it's not because people don't have the ability, it's because they don't have the opportunity and they can't see the pathway. I mean, look, I'm not going to argue. You're speaking to all the various chips on my shoulders at the moment. We could <laughs> From uh, Scotland to yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. But, uh, was it, I mean, I, I do wonder, was it really the case? I mean, the hard bit, it strikes me, was you went from school and you got into St Andrews, and that's right. a sort of amazing story. But was it really the case after St Andrews that you wouldn't have had opportunity? I mean, you, that, that's the point at which Fiona went off to Harvard. And you say you wouldn't have had the opportunities here that you would have had in the... I mean... Is that really the case? Wouldn't St Anthony's have snapped you up for a PhD? I applied to St Anthony's and didn't get any funding. Right. There you go. Because there was only one person um, could get funding from uh, my university, and she's actually now a professor at um, Durham uh, right. University. And um, I did a, a, a dual degree in Russian and modern history, and um, you know, I, she did straight Russian. Yeah. And she got a, a scholarship to go to St Anthony's. I was still on the waiting list. Uh, when I got my scholarship to go to Harvard. And if I hadn't got the funding, I wasn't going to go. I was then thinking about what else I might do. So part of opportunity is having then the ability to pick up an opportunity if you don't have any money. Yeah. So back in the um, 90s as well, I, I um, applied to be a stringer for the FT, another path not travelled. And then, you know, my interview with John Lloyd, he said, oh, well, you're going to have to pay for your own airline ticket and, you know, the things. And I thought... I haven't got any money for an airline ticket. So, OK, I won't be doing that job. So that's kind of, you know, basically part of the problem. Mm -hmm. People don't realise. When you have no money, you have no money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even a bus ticket is, um, is a bit hard. My parents had no savings. So, I mean, this is, this is the story of so many people. That, you know, an opportunity is there, but if you don't have the opportunity to make use of the opportunity, yeah. you get yourself stuck. So Harvard offered me a full scholarship and a plane ticket <laughs> and a place to stay. So that's, you know, the direction that I went. And I was still waiting for the other opportunity that might not have come. And also there was the, you know, the issue that people kept saying about the accent. I was really conscious of it all the time. I mean, yes, my accent is modulated over time. So I, I speak in my dad's telephone voice because <laughs> my dad used to pick up the phone and say, Dad, what happened to you? He said, well, nobody understands. He always said, I'm sorry, sir. I have no idea what you said. So that's happened to me so many times. Said, I'm sorry. I've, I love your accent, but I have no idea what you just said. So I find myself enunciating you know, more clearly here. But still, I, didn't, I wanted to just be myself. I didn't want to have to go and have elocution lessons and try to pretend to be someone else. And in America, it's really funny, as I say in the book, and look, Donald Trump has just recently said she'd be nothing without that accent, that woman. And I thought, that's hysterical. And I got back to Bishop Potter and said, oh, we're something, because if we've got that accent, we've got the same accent as you have. What's the odds? Because, you know, uh, when you get to the, UK, to the US, nobody knows what the accent is. They don't know what it tells you. Yeah. They don't immediately say, oh, working class from, you know, that old place with all the old nationalised industry yeah. you know, who didn't go to a grammar school or a public school, private school or Oxford or Cambridge kind of thing. I mean, Keith, one of the interesting things about it your book... It does have a chip on your shoulder, of course. It I've does. got loads of yeah, them. Yeah, loads of them. It's like a big thing over here and there. Got, yeah. the, the book's about... You see a lot of things about education in the book and how the sort of the golden ticket is getting a university degree. But, but it can be any education, by the way. Right, because I was going to and, ask and you I about that I mean, I not everyone you know, could go to university. No, exactly. And, I, and I, I do, towards the end of the book, talk about that. And I, and I don't want to give the impression that the only way to success is to, you know, go to a yeah. fancy university. Because, the, you know, um, there's a lot of people I know who've gone through further education colleges and, I mean, have done fantastically. And, you know, there, used to, there should be a lot more vocational training and be able to reskilling. It should be lifelong learning. And we, we ought to be able to give people a lot of those opportunities. Now, interestingly... My dad um, went to a lot of courses that were organised by the Durham Miners Association. Mm. Um, I was in County Durham just, you know, last week. I went to um, Red Hills, which was the Pittman's Parliament. Mm. There's a Durham Miners Association set up just around World War I. And they have all these archives there of all of the courses that the miners could take as part of their dues, the kind of welfare societies, including improving their reading and writing um, and also lecture series and book circles. And we ought to have more of that available. And again, in London, there's an awful lot of that. You have City College, you have City Lit, Burbeck. You know, anybody can, you know, over time come and study. You have local technical colleges. But that also ought to be 
made... Um, people need to be more aware of that. I mean, a lot of people actually don't know that those things are there either. Mm. And it's not just telling people in schools, but it's, you know, kind of engaging with people all the way along the way. Workplaces. Look, if you go to the, you know, sign on for unemployment, they're not just that they should send you to the local recycling place, yeah. which is where I encountered a lot of number of people last week that a couple of people I'd gone to school were working at the local recycling place. They also want to give them an opportunity to go and say, look, you could go and take a course. You know, or you can, mm. you know, basically, uh, there's all these other things that are available out there for you. I mean, to be fair, the government did put out a half-decent further education white paper. Yeah, but you have to, it's not just a white paper, actually, nobody's going to read it. You have to yeah, actually yeah, get out there and it. figure out yeah. how to tell people about it. I mean, you've, you've come back, I mean, you've made it, all right, you were on the telly, you did the MP, you know, you're famous. <laughs> are you, Some strange uh, it, reasons as well. Oh, but, but, but are you now comfortable in sort of posh southern London society? No, I'm not. I mean, so I... Presumably I, a lot of the people who wouldn't have given you a second glance back then and now inviting you to dinner parties. Well, look, it, it's, it's, it's weird for everybody, right? I mean, everybody has their own yeah. comfort zone. And I only lived in the United Kingdom in a working class environment. Yeah. So I grew up, and people say, that's ridiculous, you still think of yourself as working class, but that's my only experience here. I have a totally different experience in the United States. And when I come back and I go to see my family, I go right back into my working class environment in the north of England. Mm. And so I, I still feel that distance. Now, of course, I've spent a lot of time coming to London, and I love coming to London, and, you know, it's kind of a whole different environment, but I've never lived here in London. The only big cities I've lived in have been... Moscow was the first one. That was totally bizarre, obviously. <laughs> but in, in, but um, I've never lived in a big city in uh, the United Kingdom. The only big cities that I've lived in have always been abroad and some, somewhere else as well. Would you, I mean, you, would you accept that, you know, problems of sexism, class or accent prejudice? I mean, they're still there, but they've been tackled to an extent, haven't they? The to an extent, but the great. regional differentiation has not... Again, and that's where I think the a bit in the levelling up. Um, I do see that in the white paper. Actually, I was quite impressed with the white paper. I read it, you know, through very carefully. Then it's the kind of proof is in, um, you know, what you do next. Because I, I know that this has been, you know, a little scandalous here about the, you know, the talking about the white working class. Yeah. Um, and that kind of categorisation of white British, and then the discussions about um, white British youth, um, particularly boys and men. Uh, being uh, in, in many uh, respects the most discriminated against in the United, St United Kingdom. And it, race has nothing to do with it. It's about where people live. Mm. I'm in my hometown of Bishop Morgan, still like 98% white uh, because there's not much to attract anybody to, um, to come in and to work from anywhere else. Mm. And it's the same with all the old coastal resorts, places like Hartlepool, Wickley Bay, North and South Shields, similarly in Wales and other places, up in Scotland as well. Mm. And it's because there's a lack of opportunity and employment there. And the educational system has, has broken down as well because of the tax base uh, being reduced over time. And so it's a, it's a question of how to fix those opportunities and give, you know, kind of bridge those regional divides. So I do think there's been an awful lot of progress made on issues related to um, race in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, to gender and also to class, and particularly here in, in London and elsewhere, but the regional differentiation is still there. And uh, I you know, think that's kind of where the levelling up agenda is supposed to be uh, coming in. And it's no good just looking at Manchester and Newcastle, because there's all the other kind of places in, in between. That's not going to pull along you know, the rest of the country, and it does have political consequences. I mean, th this is mm. my hometown, 61% voted for Brexit. Yeah. And you know, recently, for the first time in 100 years, uh, there is um, a Tory MP because the feeling was that Labour just kept sending in a carpetbagger who was more interested in being in, uh, basically, um, in Westminster. And um, unfortunately, actually, I heard the same rap about the new MP. Uh, okay. But they wanted to give somebody else a chance because there was hope that somebody would actually bring something you know, back, to the, back to the town. Now, I mean, throughout the book, it's very, very clear that you have strong views about politics, but it's not clear that you have strong political views, if you see what I mean. You, yeah, and that's fair. Is it, would it be fair to say that you, you hold all sides responsible for what happened? I mean, this is a long-term process of decline, isn't it? It's not yeah. something that just happened. Well, and it didn't just happen in the 80s either. Yeah. I mean, and frankly, um, the decline happened after World War One. I. <laughs> I mean, if you really start to look at it, I mean, there's the devastation of um, a lot of those uh, places uh, in the war, the Great War, had mm. a, a really negative effect. So because men went from the mines 
uh, straight to the war, and so many of them, proportionally per capita, the greatest losses were places like in the north and Wales and Scotland, because they all joined these um, local regiments like the Durham Light Infantry and all got wiped out. Yeah. And then, you know, the, obviously the, the mines weren't that profitable during World War II, and nationalisation didn't really improve them. You know, so it, it's got a long, a long tail. Would, would you consider a career in politics? Not in politics, politics, per se, because you say, because I don't, um, I, I think I'm all over the place. I, I, I can't kind of We're find a particular home. Yes, <laughs> but, but I think in terms of political engagement, everyone can be politically engaged. And that's something that I'm, I'm trying to advocate in the United States, one well, in the United Kingdom. We've all got agency. You know, we can all do something. You don't have to be a member of parliament to, you know, to really make a difference. Interesting. Well, members of parliament can make a difference, by the way. Just, just <laughs> putting it out there. But you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to be one to to make a difference. We've come to exactly quarter past. Oh, I mean, there's loads. Of, I've got another page, but we're going to have to right. leave those yeah. for now. But Fiona, just to say, I thought that was utterly fascinating. We range far and wide. Thank you so, Thank so you. much. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.